perspectives and strategies overarching the goals of presaging and improving our focus on a strength soft skills and community service with a higher spatial resolution in order to apprise our young students and professionals with the critical skills needed to succeed in the 21st century through problem solving tips and project management etc techniques to shore up soft skills that's communication decision making leadership teamwork time management etc an importance of flexibility to account for changing dreams that's changing management and beyond all shadow of doubts we are extremely fortunate enough to have in this interactive session the welcome presence of dr manu vora as today's illustrious speaker who happens to be the chairman and president of business excellence inc a global quality management consulting firm originally a btech honors from iit bhu and ms and phd from iit chicago in chemical engineering followed by mba with marketing management in usa dr vora has been the past vice president of american society for quality as well as fellow with over 45 years of leadership experience in guiding fortune 500 companies with the us barrys performance excellence assessment a recipient of 52 awards and honors for his outstanding professional services including fulbright specialist appointment from the us department of state and 35 other prestigious ones for his lifelong community services including us president's volunteer service award and jane tata scholarship for his graduate studies at iit chicago dr vora has been teaching operations management courses as an adjunct professor at business schools around the world for 27 years associated with 80 educational institutions and global counseling for over 20 more than 12000 people dr war has appointed was appointed as a fulbright specialist by the us department of state in 2016 and the same year he accomplished the global initiative of academic network programs sponsored by mhrd government of india at iit bhu we feel proud of dr manohar has been a sought after speaker on business excellence and quality management topics with over 980 presentations in 17 countries across five continents he has been publishing over 70 scholarly articles and uh, he he wrote 50 blog posts on quality management including two technology entertainment design talks at iit bhu and iit chicago comprising of value deliberations on soft skills and quality management using technology to 50 colleges and universities in 14 states of india with an outreach of 6 lakhs and 75000 beneficiaries i'm sure the web participants and audience all around will absorb the fragrance and imbibe the elixir of this wonderful deliberation we have a learned expert to empower yourself towards performing well at your university and concerned professional career at the same has benefited more than 5000 listeners so far in usa by the value talk in high demand repeated 40 times so far well with these few words once again a great welcome to our honored speaker and you all and wish you all may i very cordially invite now dr manuvara to enlighten the participants with his value deliberation dr vora please okay thank you dr vaishampayan ji uh, for your very kind introduction and uh, <clears throat> i would like to uh, take this opportunity to thank uh, dr sandeep singh ji for inviting me in the first place and uh, i just want to make sure that i share the computer sound so because i'm playing one youtube uh, in the presentation okay so once again a very good morning to all of you and uh, namaskar 
uh, today's topic is very important to all of us because life is a journey. Uh, we just have to enjoy the ride and keep making contribution as we go along. So here is a roadmap. Uh, there are uh, four pillars for being successful in the career as well as at the university level. First pillar is planning. Second pillar is understanding our strengths and then utilizing and leveraging those strengths in whatever we do. Third pillar is the enhancing our soft skills. And fourth one, giving back to the community. So with that, and uh, towards the end, we have a very motivational YouTube by a famous football coach from University of Notre Dame. And this is American football, not soccer. So the background for this presentation uh, is based on almost uh, 58 years of my observations, starting with uh, two years of uh, first year inter-science at Khalsa College in Mumbai, uh, four years at uh, BHU at that time, now it's IIT BHU. Then coming to Chicago, spending seven years for master's and PhD. And after a while working in the industry, got my MBA. And uh, so all these learn along with serving as an educator associated with number of NGOs for the last 50 plus years, I've distilled all the learnings into this presentation. So let's enjoy the ride. So the first pillar for being successful in life is to have tremendous focus on planning. And here we have Dr. Deming cycle plan, do, study, and act. Now I'm sure people in the management field know Dr. Deming. He is one of the stalwart of quality management, father of quality management, along with Dr. Juran. So both Dr. Deming and Dr. Juran were sent to Japan by the US government after World War II to Japan to rebuild their industrial economy. And they literally took it seriously, the learning from Dr. Deming, Dr. Juran about quality improvement, process improvement, quality management. And as a result, they produce one of the finest electronics and automobiles in the world. So the bottom line is we need a 10% excellent planning and then 90% flawless execution. And that execution is the part after the planning. Do when you execute your plan, you need to study the results and make sure that the results are as planned and expected. If there are any deficiencies, you make appropriate changes, act on it, and then continue the cycle. The key learning is if you fail to plan, you are planning to fail. And I want to make one quick comment. I've been teaching in India since 2006 at various business schools, including IIT BHU since 2012. I see the lack of planning uh, creates a lot of uh, headache at the end. So if we focus on planning first, it will definitely help us to do all the activities in a proper way. And this applies to planning our career right from the beginning, what branches we want to get into based on our strengths, which is the next pillar. And leveraging those strengths, we get the best education, then select the area of a place where we want to work, the domain, and then continue to make progress and look for opportunities to grow. So this is a quick cycle on plan, do, study, and act. The second aspect is the pillar number two, understanding our own strength. So here we go to Gallup organization, which is a marketing company, gets very active during political season to see who will win, who will lose by doing the sampling and polling. They have studied successful people from around the world and put together a book called Strengths Finder 2.0 some of you may have heard about it or used the work, but the strength they define is the ability to consistently provide near perfect performance. 
and they've also defined strength as a multiplier of talent time investment so if we look at the graphics strength is in the middle three bubbles at the top thinking feeling and behaving that's the talent and three bubbles at the bottom skills knowledge and experience that's the investment so i'll give you a couple of examples one is there was a ping pong player and the coach found out that the player was so good with the four and stroke he gave him tremendous practice focusing on the four and stroke only not to worry about the back and stroke and with that singular focus on the four and stroke the player won the championship at the world level why because he was playing with his strengths secondly uh, if you have children and they are going to school and they bring the report card home five topics three a's one b and one c so put yourself in that position as a parents when you sit down with your children a uh, son or a daughter where do you spend most of your time invariably we spend time on c the theory of strength says exactly opposite focus on three a's to ensure that those a's will remain a b may become a and uh, <clears throat> the c will never become a you may want to give a little bit more resource so do not make the child miserable by focusing on the weaknesses so the ess essence of this theory of strength is you focus on your strength and manage your weaknesses so it doesn't come in the way and uh, they have identified 34 major strengths and one comment i want to make some people are raising hands we are going to take questions through the chat box at the end of my presentation to manage the time properly so please bear with us now out of 34 strengths uh, what you can do is if you are interested you can buy this book strengths finder 2.0 is available as a ebook also and uh, you have to buy the new book at the end of the book there is a sealed envelope with a code in it utilize that code to take an online test and uh, once you finish the test you get your top 5 strengths and what do you do with that result you put it on your resume or curriculum vitae just below the object objective my top 5 strengths so that becomes the point of conversation when you are applying for a higher level position or looking for a new opportunity and it's extremely important to understand our own strengths and leverage them throughout our life a lot of time what happens in the life we keep working on different things we don't realize what we are good at until we are almost ready to retire and then it's too late so in my case personally i was very good in studies for chemistry and mathematics so the combination of two allowed me to do very well in chemical engineering at bhu the temple of learning built by mahamana pandit madan mohan malaviya ji and here are the five top strengths as a sample out of 34 for myself so i am an arranger more like a conductor of a symphony i see all the variables i enjoy arranging them so that beautiful music comes out of the symphony secondly i am an achiever i have inner drive that keeps me moving third i am a learner i get energized by the journey from ignorance to competence fourth i am a maximizer i look for excellence not the average from myself first and then from people around me including the family members and tip i am a relator i start building the relationship once i come in contact with the people so the key is leverage your strengths during the study time at the university as well as prepare yourself well so that you will succeed in any career you choose to go into now gallup has written another book soar with your strengths there is a humorous sentence and let me read that you don't teach a pig to sing it annoys the pig and waste your time so you don't teach a pig to sing it annoys the pig 
and it wastes your time. So as we know, the pigs are not very good at singing. When you poke them or provoke them, they'll make funny noises. And this is what we do in real life. We beat up people that you are doing this wrong and that wrong. We never appreciate the good things they bring on the table. They feel miserable and they are not giving their best. So always look for strengths in the people. And a lot of time others can tell you what your strengths are. Sometimes we are not very crystal clear about what our strengths are. So find out what your strengths are. Make sure that you are playing with your strengths and you are doing absolutely best you are capable of doing. Now we segue into the third pillar for success. Let me share with you World Economic Forum data, future of job reports, and focus on the left side, the top 10 skills needed. And since the writing is a little bit small, uh, let me read it to you. 10 critical skills needed to succeed in 2020 at the global level are complex problem solving, critical thinking, creativity, people management, coordinating with others, emotional intelligence, judgment and decision making, service orientation, negotiation, and cognitive flexibility. Uh, can I request uh, everybody to go on a mute? Uh, I'm hearing some background noise. Thank you. So if you look at those 10 items, and we have a lot of educators in the audience, unfortunately, our curriculum doesn't include most of these items. So it's important. It's very important to include these items in the curriculum so that our students are well prepared to tackle the challenges when they enter the workforce. Now let's begin the journey in the soft skills area. We focus first on communication. Second half of the screen says, no matter what job you have in life, your success will be determined 5% by your academic credentials, 50% percent by your professional experiences and 80 percent by your communication skills and you have to fill in communication skills plus other soft skills like leadership initiative decision making meeting management time management etc uh, kindly those who are raising hand if you have a question you can write it in the chat box and I'll cover the questions after the end of the presentation. Thank you. And we need to be proficient in all three areas, the verbal, the written, and the presentation. And the basic idea is whatever we do, whether it's verbal communication, written, or presentation, it has to be effective and it requires tremendous amount of practice. You keep practicing and you will get better. So let me give you one personal example. I was at BHU uh, and in my one of the classes in the second year of the five-year program, uh, one faculty put me down. I was always prepared. I come from middle-class family, so I, my focus was to get the best education from the top institute. Unfortunately, that faculty did not like because I was asking a lot of questions, so he put me down. And after that, I went into my own inner shell and I did not ask many questions until my program was over. Then I came to US, I understood the value of speaking up because people without any value will keep doing a lot of talking. Then I decided I have to do something. If I know the subject and if I can add value, I must speak up. So I begin to open up both during my master's and PhD program, then at the MBA level. And then I got more coaching help from my mentor at at and Bell Labs, where he told me that when you are giving a presentation in front of large number of people, people will listen to you if you have some value to add. So have a self-confidence and keep smiling. And uh, generally the lights will be down in the auditorium he will be in the front row. He, he said, I'll keep smiling at you. You smile back at me. And that's how I began to overcome my fear. 
So that was the case in the early years. Now as a faculty, you have to pay me to stop talking. And I'm sure all of us as a faculty love to talk always. So that is the story of communication. It requires tremendous amount of practice and it's never ending pursuit to continue to hone up our communication. Next one, I want to share a very simple tool called tree diagram for decision making. I'm sure some of you may have taught quality management. This is the tool originated from Japan and adopted all over the world. On a single diagram, by putting all the information and the facts together, you can move from decision, highest level decision one on the left side to the final outcome. And uh, unfortunately, this is not the right choice of the example because of the COVID-19, nobody is going anywhere. But when the situation improves down the road, decision level one, you want to go on vacation. It opens up opportunity at decision level two, three different options. And for each of those options at decision two, there are more options at decision level three leading to a definite outcome. So you can traverse your journey going from left to right and select the right outcome you want to get by traversing on one of the path. So this is a very simple but very comprehensive tool. I would highly recommend when you are making complex decisions, start making use of simple tools like a tree diagram. Next comes the issue and this is a continuation of decision making. What branches are we going to select? And basic idea is we want to first understand our strength and leverage that strength and our liking to find the right discipline to get into for studies. In my case, I mentioned chemistry and mathematics. So chemical engineering was natural choice. But of course, there are many other branches of engineering, mechanical, civil, electrical, telecommunication, mining, metallurgy, material science, etc. Some people decide to go into business. For my MBA, I chose marketing as a major, but you can go to operations, finance, uh, strategy, etc. Some people may prefer to go into law. There are many sub branches medicine, number of different areas you can get into, pediatrics, uh, internal medicine, surgery, ophthalmology, etc., psychiatry. And then depending on your interest, you may enter either into fine arts, liberal arts, life sciences, or pharmaceutics. But ultimately, you're looking for a meaningful work. So this decision-making final outcome is finding a meaningful work. And I started out in the corporate 20 years ago. I became an entrepreneur, started my company, quality management consulting. Along the way, I've been uh, associated with a number of nonprofit organizations. Last 27 years, dabbled into education as adjunct faculty in the business schools. I've not worked for the government, but uh, trained a number of uh, government entities in Egypt on site. Uh, people from Turkey, various ministries came to US and people from China, mainly in Mongolia, they had come to our university here in the Chicago area. And I interacted with them and taught them a number of different topics. So, and some people may decide to go into R&D labs. So if you remember the idea of decision making is you start out with the choice of your branch but ultimate aim is by having that knowledge and expertise, you want to find some meaningful work. Now, in the 20th century, people said that if you want to be successful, you needed three skills. And those critical skills were reading, writing, and arithmetic. In the 21st century, those three skills are taken for granted, but you need to shore up three new skills. And those new skills for the 20th century are the teamwork, problem solving, and project management. So teamwork, problem solving, and project management. If we can master those three skills and allow our students to be mastered at those skills, 
they will do very well when they enter the work arena. Now for the teamwork, some of you may have seen this work by Patrick Lencioni, five dysfunctions of a team. And these dysfunctions need to be evaluated as soon as the team is put in place. It's the obligation of the team leader or the project manager to ensure that the members have a trust with each other by sharing their strengths and weaknesses. So you take advantage of the theory of strength. That's the Strengths Finder 2.0 we talked about. Secondly, do not create artificial harmony when you are sitting down in a meeting. Normally one or two people speak, rest of the people are quiet. Now decisions are made on a partial information. So the whole idea is if six or seven members working on a team, they all need to speak up for the issue based on all the discussion, make a collective decision, what's the one most important item we need to work on, and then people give 100% support behind it. Third, commitment comes when there is a no ambiguity. So the team leader has to make specific and very unambiguous assignment to each person as a task and subtask. Then you can get the commitment from your team members. Fourth, when assignments are made for executing a task or a subtask, people who are responsible, they need to bring in the results because their results are needed to move on and collectively put together the final outcome. And last item is sometimes people get carried away with their own status and ego and they do not work in the team as a member and they have no idea what the results team needs to achieve. So that is detrimental to achieve the best teamwork and best outcome from the team. That is just for the fun. So what is teamwork? A team is many hands and one mind. So when collectively we put together our ideas, but we blend into one and come together as a single unified voice, that will be the most powerful team. And let me make a comment about uh, Eastern world like India versus the Western world as far as teamwork is concerned. Sorry to say that in India, teamwork is still not as valued we have individually brilliant people, but you put those people in the groups and teams, they do not act in a coherent way. Almost they act like a fools. But you take the Western world, individually they are not as smart as people are in India, but collectively they are one of the most powerful teams and they will achieve whatever task given to them. So I think we have a lot of learning to do to develop passion for becoming a member of the team and give our best to make the team the successful one. Next, time management. Uh, I'm sharing the Eisenhower box. There are four quadrants on the y-axis, important or not important, x-axis, urgent or not urgent. So the quadrant which matters the most is the top right, important, but not urgent. Here we need to spend roughly 90 to 95% of our time at the workspace by doing all the planning, doing the researching, develop, working with our stakeholders, developing long-term strategies, and then taking some time out to recharge our battery. Five to 10% in the top left quadrant, important and urgent, that's a firefighting and get it out of the way. And by the way, sometimes there are clever people in the organization who will start the fire unknown to the top leadership. Then they will come out rushing with the fire hoses, put the fire down, and they are hailed as a heroes because top management generally have no idea what's happening at the ground level. If you really want to appreciate and recognize, recognize people who are working in the top right quadrant on important thing, not urgent things. And uh, the other two quadrants, bottom right, delete it, bottom left, uh, delegate it to others so that your valuable time is not wasted in the workplace. 
Now, uh, time management, uh, the monitor says the bad news is time flies. The good news is you are the pilot. And I saw a very nice definition of time on a Facebook. So let me read it. Time is slow when you wait. Time is fast when you are late. Time is deadly when you are sad. Time is short when you are happy. Time is endless when you are in pain. Time is long when you feel bored. Every time, time is determined by your feelings and your psychological conditions and not by clocks. So have a nice time always. So remember that, that's the nice definition of time. Now we come to the another critical skill to be successful in the 21st century, the problem solving. Now I'm sure there are a number of engineers in the audience and the best way to solve a problem is take time out to properly define the problem. I hope you all of you agree with that. Generally, what engineers do in a hurry, they find a solution and they keep hunting for what problem have we solved. So let's not do that mistake. Second one is once we have properly defined the problem, find out using the data, what is the magnitude of the problem, or find out the root causes, where the problem comes from. In the fourth step, find possible solution to reduce the root causes. And if we find a solution which reduces the root causes to a next level down, make that solution permanent and change the standard operating procedure. And then you are ready to tackle the next important problem. So problem solving is not a rocket science. It's a simple methodology, but it requires a focus on going through step by step solving the problem. And last, third critical skill to be mastered is the project management. And uh, research shows the world over 25 to 30% of the projects are successful, rest fail. Uh, I was teaching change management in uh, Egypt with the government officers and they said, we have success rate in the government projects, one out of five, 20% only. So, the whole idea is if you want to make our projects 100% successful, the project leaders need to overcome five crises of silence from a beautiful article from MIT Sloan Management Review. The very first crisis we need to tackle is the plan around the facts. The project must be planned around the facts. Secondly, the project sponsor must provide support. Third, we need to be faithful to the project management process, and this is to be done by the team. Fourth, honestly assess progress and the risk. That means team meets once a week, have a quick status review, only review of status, no solving the problem in that status meeting. And simultaneously, you have identified the risk for the project and you continue to assess whether the risk is going to be detrimental or is it under control and team members must pull their weight if out of seven members one or two people are slacking off the outcome of that project will be suboptimal so all members of the team needs to take the responsibility and provide their best output then we come to the change management area so we start out as a student, select a branch of whatever is available and whatever your areas of interest is at a given time. But during the lifetime, as you enter the workspace, there'll be new opportunities, new experiences, circumstances can change, and that will allow you to branch out into different things. So one need to be very flexible about decision-making and then take advantage of the opportunity available to you as and when it comes along. So at a personal level, I started out as a chemical engineer, worked in the chemical industry after my doctoral program for seven and a half years. Then I was laid off when there was energy crisis back in 1973. So I started doing my MBA and then got picked up by AT&T Bell Labs, where I chose to move from chemical engineering to telecommunication. 
And within a year, I got a special assignment to work on quality management. And that changed my entire outlook in life and my career. So for more than 70, 16 years out of 17 and a half years at at and Bell Lab, I was working in the quality management area, starting at the ground level, working with the entire organization of 10,000 plus people at my location in Naperville, Illinois, outside of Chicago. And uh, learned from the best of the best, Dr. Dem Deming, Dr. Juran, et cetera, and brought the best practices in the company. And I also undertook the coaching of the Baldrige Performance Excellence Award to raise the profile of the at and where we ended up winning three Baldrige Awards as a at and as a company, one in manufacturing, two in the service side of the house. Along the way, I started teaching quality management in the business school to bring the practical experience as well as the theory. And uh, since I come from uh, a middle-class family, I had lost my parents by the age of six. My extended family and the friends helped me along. And I've been helped many times by God on at many different levels, including Tata scholarship to come and uh, study here in my entire doctoral program, education was free. So back in 89, when we came to know about India as a 15 million blind people, we started a foundation, Blind Foundation for India, and very happy to share that in 31 years, we have raised 5 million US dollars to support 2 million people, million adults and million children to have free eyesight checkup. Uh, 210,000 free cataract operations, 10,000 braille kits, and 132 mobile ones have been given to take doctors to villages and bring patients back for cataract operation, including two major vans to Ramakrishna Mission in Luxa in Banaras, Varanasi, and uh, eight two uh, wheelers, the scooters, so that they can go to the villages and uh, provide the services to women, children who are in need of primary health care, education, etc. So this is the life. Uh, our dreams keep changing, uh, new opportunity keep coming. We need to be ready. So when we are ready, we can take advantage of the opportunity knocking at us. Now the last pillar, the community service. And here we look up to the founder of BHU, Pandit Madan Mohan Malaviya Ji. What he says is, I have no desire for kingdom, no desire for heaven, no desire for moksha. The only desire I have is to mitigate the sorrow of the living beings who are ridden with sorrow. I want to shine light into the darkness before people's eyes. That is the education. And I've been so very fortunate to study at the Temple of Learning, built by the great Pandit Madan Mohan Malaviya Ji, and he also says the knowledge without humility is worthless. So more knowledge you have, you need to be most humble because that's your obligation to pass it on to others. Now I'll share with you two active case study in the community area, community service area, and then we'll close in with a nice YouTube and then we'll take question and answers. So first project is the free Gyandan. We started out in 2013 at IDBHU, my alma mater. Now here's a very interesting quote. When you share the knowledge, it multiplies. When you hold the knowledge, it dies. And I'm sure all the educators in the audience will fully agree with me that all of us are the purveyor of knowledge. We give our knowledge to our students, make them the best and we cherish their success when they do better than ourselves. And that is the contributions the educators make. So teaching in India since 2006 in business schools and later on in the engineering colleges, I found that India, we have brilliant students, but they neglect the soft skills. So, and looking at my personal example, I was a rank holder, expert in technical side, but weak on the soft skills. 
I picked that up while working with a number of multinationals here in the US, including AT&T Bell Labs, where we had a tremendous opportunity to learn each and every subject of interest to build up the professional development. So we started this experiment using technology, the Google Hangout at IIT BHU, and we engaged the students on a 12 topics, one per month, five topics in soft skills shown in blue, leadership, teamwork, time management, meeting management, and decision making, and seven topics in quality management, my area of expertise. That included project management, risk management, talent management, voice of customer management, operation excellence, supply chain management, and sustainable change management. And uh, interestingly, with the help from American Society for Quality India office, we are able to connect with 50 colleges. Only thing is because of the limitation of number of nodal points we can join on Google Hangout, used to have nine universities at a time. So there were a number of series running in parallel in between 2013 to 2016. We delivered this program sitting here at night, uh, starting at 10 to 11 in the night, going up to early hours next day in the morning to 50 colleges, universities in 14 states of India, benefiting 6,75,000 people attending live as well as through the recorded YouTubes, which was made public. Now, uh, this uh, slide I'm sharing with you. A top right picture, Swami Nikhilesharananji was the secretary Maharaj at the Ramakrishna Mission in Vadodara. He has now moved to Rajkot. He invited me to go to Bizek studio in Gandhinagar, the capital of Gujarat, where Commissioner of Higher Education, Mr. A.J. Shah, shown in the white shirt, he has now retired. And I was given 45 minutes to talk on the subject of effective time management. At that time, via satellite, we connected with 450 colleges, all colleges in the state of Gujarat. And this presentation was shared live with 5 lakh students. So the technology can make a tremendous impact in sharing our ideas and reaching out to students and faculties in remote areas of India. Now, uh, let me talk a little bit about uh, the future direction on the skilling model. So first on these bubbles on the graphics on the right, I was invited with my prior work in Egypt with a new university coming on in Alexandria in Egypt as an international advisor. They asked me to come up with a curriculum to strengthen the core curriculum for a new university starting in engineering, business, medicine, and pharmacy because Egypt has a similar problem like India, unemployment, underemployment. So I put together a program on soft skills, leadership, communication, research method, quality method, community service, entrepreneurship, and soft skills. And these topics would be studied along with the core curriculum, and there would be a portfolio created for each of the students for a four or five year program. Every year, along with the core curriculum, they study these topics. They study both theory and practice in terms of doing the project in teams. They get graded. And overall, they have to achieve 80% to get the diploma. And this portfolio, they can show it to the prospective employer when they are ready to go for interview. And since they have exposure to these areas of skills, which others will not have, they are more likely to be selected and they are more likely to continue to hone up these skills and become more proficient at the workplace and continue to make progress. So bottom line is one need to master the soft skill. When you do that, you master your destiny. Now, uh, my uh, simple idea is these kind of things have to be in, 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 included in our curriculum. And this is the obligation of AICTE. Rather than somebody does this as a patchwork after they graduate or industry has to pick up the slack, will it not be nice to have these skills integrated into the curriculum in a 
proper way to create this portfolio approach, which can make tremendous amount of sense for the workplace, for all the graduates. And by the way, one statistic, India Today, I saw it about a year back, out of all the engineering graduates uh, coming out every year, only 7% have the right skills to do their engineering job. 93% lack any engineering skill. In other words, most of the institution, leaving aside IITs, NITs, and reputable universities, most of the universities are failing their students by not giving them the right skills. And that's a shame that needs to be addressed. And top left, Modi ji has given this clarion call to Skilling India by training our youngsters uh, between the age of 20 to 35, the youth, and only way we can do that massive amount of training is using the technology. Because technology, as we saw, we did that experiment. It was successful at IIT BHU, and then we expanded it to 14 states of India. Now, the last case study I wanted to share in giving back is Free Chakshudan Project. We started out in 1989. And uh, this is Tamso Ma Kamaya would kindly lead us from darkness to light. So the basic idea for this program goes back to 1959 when I was in my eighth grade class and I had a freak accident during Diwali time playing with the firecrackers. I was uh, very naughty and naive. So I took the firecracker, one of them which had not gone off. I put a puff of air and it exploded on my face. And lo and behold, I had a third degree burn, my entire face was burned up and I was blind. So I was rushed to the hospital for 24 hours. I could not see anything. Luckily the eye doctor removed the residue and I regained the eyesight. And exactly 30 years later, when we came to know through Dr. Rajendra Vyas who was visiting from Bombay to our place here in Chicago area, he said, in India, we have 15 million blind. You are about 1 million Asian Indian. Do something for us. So God planted a seed back in 1959. 30 years later, that became a blind foundation for India. So you know how the God works in a mysterious ways. And that's why I have a very soft corner for blind people. And put yourself, say 30 seconds, 40 seconds, you close your eyes and see what kind of world you will be dealt with if you do not have the eyesight. It's a very miserable life. So over 31 and a half, 31 plus years, we have been giving this service through this foundation and the website is blindfoundation.org. I'll quickly run through what we do. Uh, the mission is very simple, to prevent and cure blindness and to provide education and rehabilitation to permanently blind people in India. And as I mentioned, India accounts for one third of the world blind population and India has 15 million blind people. And the issue is prevalent in all states. Now through the foundation and our small team, we have raised so far $5 million. I talked about 210,000 free cataract operation, 2 million people got their eyesight checked, children and adults. Braille kits were given to blind children, 132 mobile ones in 19 states of India to take the doctor to villages and bring patients back for cataracts. And we have matched the work with Rotary Matching Program, 15 major projects worth half a million dollars, five lakh dollars, one to three matched. Now, if some of you may be shopping on Amazon, uh, you can indirectly help Blind Foundation by choosing Amazon Smile and keeping Blind Foundation as a recipient for all the purchases you make, 0.5% money comes back to BFI on a regular basis. So summing up giving back impact, 1989 to present, free Gyan Dan, 6,75,000 people benefited and free Chakshudan, uh, 20 lakhs, 2 million people have been benefited. Now, uh, this is mainly targeted to students. Uh, there is a beautiful article I came across in CNN 
what best skills one need to have on the resume. This is where the balance between hard and soft skills should be there. Back up your skill with the evidence and develop the skills you are lacking. If you have a very powerful resume, including your top five strengths, you can open up any door you want to. Beginning to wrap up the presentation, and I'll focus in the middle part only because we have educators mainly in the audience. So the first obligation of us as a faculty is to continue to renew our knowledge. So put it this way, if we are not at a cutting edge, how can we give the knowledge, cutting edge knowledge to our students? Secondly, we should engage our students. We need to be the role model, and our goal is to instill the cooperation, collaboration among students and encourage their curiosity, creativity, and confidence, and very important to balance the theory and practice. As I mentioned, after working in the industry, I started teaching. So I had a natural advantage of bringing the practice into the classroom. And students appreciate that much more rather than bookish knowledge by just having a degree with no practical experience. So the guidance is either you work in the industry for a few years and then join the university, or while at the university, find the consulting opportunity to do the projects with the help of your students so you understand how the industry works. Our goal should be not to give solution to students, but allow them and encourage them to think and find the solution themselves. And we need to be a good listener. And role of the educator is to take the rough diamonds, all the students incoming, continue to remove the dust from the diamond and make them shine as soon as they are ready to enter the workplace and mentor other educators. If you are there with experience, somebody is struggling, give them a hand and uh, it will benefit you as well as the new people who are getting into the stream. One additional thought about how will you measure your life? So this is from the famous Professor Clayton Christensen, uh, Professor Emeritus Harvard Business School. He just passed away earlier this year. He wrote a beautiful article in the HBR. Uh, he gave a lecture to the graduating class after the economic bubble that busted here, the 2007-2008 real estate crisis here, the market went down and the world over there was a depression. So the graduating class, he gave this lecture and what he said that you need to measure your right life by creating a strategy for your life similar to how you manage the strategy in the workplace. Allocate your personal resources wisely Third, create a family culture of cooperation and collaboration. Fourth, do not cross the ethical line because once you cross the ethical line once, you get a benefit, slight advantage. You will have a tendency to keep doing more of it and then one day you will go behind bar. And he gave the example of a person, Jeffrey Skilling from Enron Corporation, who was his classmate at Oxford. And that person went behind bar because they were doing hanky-panky at uh, the company to raise the stock price to benefit the top leadership. Next, be humble. No matter what kind of education you get, and by the way, people who get the MBA from Harvard Business School, they command six-figure salary, $100,000 or more per year. So he says, no matter how much education you have, but when you come in contact with others, be humble because everybody has something else to teach you. And the last is do not use money or number of houses or the vehicles as a yardstick for success. Your yardstick should be how many people have you touched and helped during your lifetime. And that yardstick should be the right yardstick to measure the value of your life. And I'm very happy to share that over 2 million people through Blind Foundation and almost a million people through education initiative we have undertaken over the years. And that is the real satisfaction because, and I say this to everyone that out of 7 billion plus people on this face of the earth, 
there is not a single person who has figured out how to take either the wealth or the knowledge with them when time comes to go and meet the creator. So isn't it better to give it away while we are here on the earth so that others can benefit and we are getting it from somebody, we can pass it on before we go up. Okay, now I'm going to play this beautiful YouTube. Uh, this is about how one can inspire and motivate oneself. And this is from a famous football coach, Lou Holtz, University of Notre Dame. So let's enjoy the YouTube. I was born with a silver spoon in my mouth, I know. I was born in Fallsby, West Virginia. <laughs> and I went by where I was born last night, about 1030. I was born in a cellar at home, delivered by Dr. McGraw. We had one bedroom for my sister, myself, and my parents. We had a half bath and a kitchen. Seven and a half years we lived in that place. There was no welfare. There was no food stamps. There was no safety net. But I always had plenty to eat. Because every time I asked for seconds, my dad would say, no, you had plenty. <laughs> but the reason I was born with a silver spoon, my dad had only gone to the third grade. That's all the education he had. But why was I born with a silver spoon in my mouth? Because I was taught by my parents. And life's a matter of making choices, wherever you are, good or bad, because of choices you make. Don't blame anybody else, but if you get an education, you're willing to work and overcome problems and difficulties, in this great country, you can amount to something. That's how I, that's why I was born with a silver spoon. I was in this country and I was taught personal responsibility for choices you make. When we talk about a commitment to excellence, that's a choice you make. What do you want to do? Having hopes and dreams and ambition. See, I think that is absolutely critical. Don't make the mistake I made. I've done a lot of dumb things, but let me tell you one thing I regret. We went to the University of Notre Dame. We took a program on the bottom. We took it to the very top. And for nine straight years, we went to a January one bowl, the sugar, the cotton, the orange, or the fiesta. Nobody's done it before. Nobody's done it since. We put it on top and we maintained it. And that's the thing I regret the most. See, there's a role in life that says you're either growing or you're dying. The tree's either growing or it's dying. So is grass, so is a marriage, so is a business, so is a person. Doesn't have a thing to do with age. My birthday candles cost more than a cake. <laughs> but it has everything to do. Am I trying to get better? Am I trying to prove we got on top and say, you know, this is pretty good. Let's maintain it. Let's not take any risk. We finished second of the country at Notre Dame. Everybody called me an idiot. I finished his last in medical school, they call him doctor. That doesn't seem fair. <laughs> when I left Notre Dame, I never thought I'd coach again. Where do you go from Notre Dame? According to my mother, you go directly to heaven, you sit by the Pope. You, you don't coach anymore. <laughs> and then I went to live in a town where the average age was deceased. <laughs> and when I found out, I wasn't tired of coaching. You have to have something to hope for, something to dream. And even though you've done great things so far, what's going to happen now? I want to give you a simple plan. Life doesn't have to be complicated. I try to keep life simple. Do you realize there are only seven colors of the rainbow? Only seven. Look what Michelangelo did with those seven colors. There's only seven musical notes. Look what Beethoven did with those seven notes. There's only 10 numbers. Look what Bernie Madoff did with those 10 numbers. <laughs> the point I make is it doesn't have to be complicated. See, you need four things in your life. If you don't have any of these four things in your life, you're going to have a tremendous void. See, everybody needs something to do. Number two, everybody needs someone to love. Number three, everybody needs someone to believe in. In my case, it's Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. But the fourth thing you need in your life is you need something to hope for. There's never a right time to do the wrong thing. And there's never a wrong time to do the right thing. Just do what's right. I think it's right to be honest, right to be on time. 
Today, ladies and gentlemen, enjoy life. Have fun. You're going to have problems. You're going to have difficulties. That's part of life. And don't tell people about your problems. You know that 90% of the people don't care. <laughs> and the other 10% are glad you got them. So you're better off keeping your up. You're going to have problems. But have fun with what you're doing. People say, did you have fun doing the ESPN? Not really. Because if you have fun being here, people have fun being around. Doesn't mean I don't do dumb things. And sometimes I wasn't real honest. Do everything to the best of your ability with time allotted. You know, ladies and gentlemen, not all of us be all American. Not everybody be first team. Everybody can be the best you're capable of being. And I want to tell you, if you want to fail, you have the right to fail. That's what's great about this country. You do not have the right to cause other people to fail because you don't do everything best you're good at. When you join a spouse, you bring a child in the world, you join a business, you join a team, you have obligation responsibilities and you owe it to other people to do the maximum you can at each and everything you do. It's not complicated. And the last rule is to show people you care. When you walk in the room, your attitude, hey, here I am, look at me. It's like, no. Your attitude, there you are, how can I help you? I wish I knew those three rules when I was 21. I've used them for the last 40 years. There's a statue of me at Notre Dame. I guess they need a place for the pigeons to land, but <laughs> if you go look at it, just don't look to look at three words on the pedestal. Trust. Commitment, love. So Lit Mobile just Okay, I'll go back to these uh, slides again. So, just to summarize, bottom line is you should chase excellence, then success will follow you. Remember Nike, just do it. Because if we are good at execution, a lot of good things will happen. And that is one of the sincere requests. Focus more on project management, get to work, rather than keep talking about it. And bottom line, expect nothing and appreciate everything. So let us light a lamp of knowledge to eliminate darkness of ignorance. So at this point, I'll stop sharing and we'll go to the chat box. There are some things sitting there and I'll start taking the question and read them. And uh, <clears throat> okay, I have to uh, first make uh, Sandeep Ji host. So let me go there first. Host. Okay, so I've made you host and I'll take the questions from the chat box. Yeah, okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Manu, for such a nice presentation. Now, mm -hmm. uh, I request that all the participants, if you have any questions, then please type in the chat question answer box. So, Professor uh, Dr. Manu will take the one by one. Like, uh, there are four questions till now. So, please go by one by one. Yeah, sure. Just uh, scanning through for a real question. Yeah. So first question, I think Dr. Rekha Singh has, what should be the typical career path for the management studies? How to mm -hmm. decide whether they should go for marketing, finance or HR? Yeah. Yeah. So basically, as I mentioned, figure out what your interest level is and what's your area of strength. So when I was uh, starting my MBA program, I realized that I needed to hone up my skill in the marketing. 
and uh, of course the western world marketing is one of the top area where they can sell anything and everything to the world right and in india we are not as good in marketing we may be brilliant in doing our things but if we cannot market it then it's not useful so at individual level one has to make a choice what is important and what will give you the most value as you go forward in life so that would be my answer to selection of a field where you have interest and strength and where you will do better in the long term and uh, one thing to remember you need to have a passion for something and focus on achieving the goal for a longest term not for a short term so don't compromise your goals for the short term go for the long term okay uh, and the next question is from uh, santosh dubey okay uh, his question is how can the weight helps in the personal management process please justify the point okay uh, i don't understand what you want to yeah. ask <laughs> yeah yeah sometimes i think asking a question is a skill we all have to develop right focus yeah. on one liner so that i the speaker can understand and answer it properly so you can uh, tell me the question and i'll uh, answer the it the question he typed here is how can the weight helps in the personal management process okay so the personal management process one is we have to manage ourselves personally so if you want to be a good leader try to focus on your personal time management because if you cannot manage yourself how can you manage others right very simple so they say you should put 50% of effort in managing yourself and keep improving in what all you do and see people uh, follow you and your actions not the words you can tell people to do something but when they see you doing something else they will do exactly what you are doing not what you are saying so personal management is all about managing our time wisely doing the right thing being ethical supporting others and rejoicing the success of others rather than having jealousy and cutthroat competition we should focus on cooperation and collaboration where everybody wins it's not just me and everybody else down no everybody lift, is lifted up so together we can do wonderful thing uh, next question please uh, the next question is from uh, khare what mm -hmm. will be the business prospects after the covid 19 yeah so this is a very tough situation and those of you understand the risk management this is a black swan event nobody had predicted it it is upon us so now we have to take appropriate steps so the first step is to survive because if we don't survive and if we get infected and if we pass away nothing matters so first thing is our own survival survival of our family so that's a very first step secondly okay. if you are running the, running the organization then you need to think about looking after your people and here the top leadership should make a decision to take pay cut and give that money to people who are at the working level so they can bring food on the table for their families and themselves so simple honest decisions and asking people collectively as a team what is the best solution to come out of this and take step by step approach to come back to near normal as soon as the business cycle goes up and this is the time when business cycle is down try to have more education more training build up on the research capability build up on your quality discipline etc and uh, those who do this planning and do it well will come out roaring when the business cycle goes up next question please uh, next question is from akash barua yeah mm -hmm. uh, his question is that uh, is a master student in the social work and also a social activist so how can i grow in the field and what should the skill knowledge we need yeah yeah so the social activity social entrepreneurship requires first of all good teamwork also collaboration with others see in india i see so many ngos doing things and we work with many ngos from our side mostly ramakrishna missions 
And what we tell them is do the collaboration among sister units. So if you have a very specific equipment, which we donate to you money for it, try to share it as wisely and as widely as possible. So that collaborative spirit has to be there in order to be successful mm -hmm. in the social setting, in the social field. And of course, having honesty, integrity, ethics, and listening to other people, finding out what the real issues are, and then focusing on the right issues with the right team and take it forward. And this is how we started the foundation back in 1989. And, uh, coming from the quality discipline. Personally, we have kept our board very small, six members on the board. Our focus is not to waste time in the debates, but roll up the sleeve and do the real work to support blind people in India. And this is how we get the work done. So focus on action and orientation about proactive work rather than keep talking about it. Uh, next question. Uh, okay, we are running out of time. So I will quickly take two or three more questions and then sure. I will hand over to Mrs. Ritu Singh for a word of thanks. So next mm -hmm. question is from Priyanka. And I think uh, this is a good question. Is language problem considered as a barrier, barrier in the improvement of the personal life? Well, uh, <clears throat> see the uh, language is the way you express yourself. So as I'm giving you my personal example, I was afraid to speak in front of people. I had to continue to practice on it. And then more practice you do, you get the confidence. And make sure that you have some value to add. Don't talk rubbish. So when you have some good value to add, people are always there to listen to you. Because if you have a good thing to share, people will listen, they will appreciate, they will give you feedback. And you can do the practice in front of your other friends and take the opportunity to work with each other, take some coaching help and make sure that you are very good at communication. And let me give you one example, importance of communication. There was a technical company with lots of people with great experience, number of years. A new person arrives on scene. He has so-so technical knowledge, but... He was extremely good in soft skill communication and working with others. So he got promoted. So old timers got worried, went to the manager, asking the manager, why are you giving a favor to this new person? So he said, okay, set him everybody down. He said, I can hire all of you techies, dime a dozen, but to find a rare combination of good technical understanding, but very good at working with people, soft skill, communication, rare combination. That's the reason he's promoted. He's not getting any favor. So always remember, if you have great ideas, but if you cannot communicate across the table, those ideas remain ideas and you get frustrated and you leave. But if you are good at communication, you can share your ideas. Others will listen to you and together you can collaborate to create something Brilliant. Next, uh, maybe the last question. Yeah, uh, the last question is from, uh, I don't know the name of the audience is the, the participant is not here. The question is that on the, he's asking on the behalf of his elder brother, I'm facing mm -hmm. problem in them managing my job along with the, my UPSC preparation. How can I do so? Kindly enlighten me. Okay, so manage the job uh, during the preparation for higher studies or something? Is that the question? I don't know. He, he, he did not mention anything else. He just asked, he's preparing for UPSC examination and how yeah, can do right, so with that. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, so this is where time management comes into play, right? So you have to allocate time to do your work uh, first because that's where you are earning. And secondly, have a fixed time to study. And uh, study, uh, and at least what I developed a good habit at BHU was before I go to the class, I would have seen the material once by reading the chapter, not understanding everything, but having the idea of what will be discussed in the class. Then in the class, take a lot of good notes and ask relevant questions. And once I come back, same day, whatever the material was covered in the class, I will review it one more time to ensure that 
everything is crystal clear and put it away in my brain bank. So on a daily basis, I was building up before the final exam at that time, nine months, one exam, 13 subjects. And this was the mode of operation. And I developed the habit that first eight months do good studies, manage the time wisely, last month no studies because I already finished everything. And I had a photogenic memory. And in last month, my friends would use my notes because they have not studied for the first eight months. So they will come and pose me difficult questions. And that allowed me to go into more fundamental level, understand the subjects much better and explain to them and clarify their doubts. But that helped me much more than them others. So they got benefited, I got the benefit. So if you manage your time wisely, it will benefit you. And also remember to have a sharing attitude, helping others to come up in life. And ultimately, God has sent us with a single mission to help others on this earth. If we can do that, it it be a good legacy to leave it before we go. Because everybody has a ticket written. We don't know when we are going. Mm. And that is a good thing. Otherwise, I will die of fear. So we'll leave it at that. Uh, time management, extremely critical. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Bora. Actually, there are so many questions, so I would request the participant that you can directly email to the Bora if you have any question later. So, mm -hmm. uh, now I would like to uh, thank all the panelists, including Professor Biyarsat. And now I would like to hand over uh, to Ritu, for a of thanks. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Uh, good morning, all. As all good things came to an end, so is the webinar. On behalf of SMS Lucknow and ICET Foundation, I take this opportunity to propose a vote of thanks to those who have directly or indirectly contributed to this webinar on career development guidance. At the outset, I thank our chief guest and resource person, Dr. Manu K. Vora. We are really enlightened with your knowledge and presence, sir. As we all know, you have vast experience and it's an honor for us to have you as an speaker. Sir, sir has told us about different phases, what an engineer phase, faces in India. And the best thing, what I have learned, that follow excellence and success will follow. Thank you, sir. We are thankful to our Honorable Director General, Dr. B.R. Singh, sir and Dean Dr. Dhamen Singh for their motivation. I would like to thank Founder President of ICIT Foundation, Dr. Sandeep Singh, General Manager SMS, Dr. Suren Srivastava, HOD CS, Dr. Heman Singh, and HOD EC, Mr. Rahul Mishra for their enthusiastic support. A special thanks to all faculties and organizing committee for their coordination and a heartful thank to our participants for their active participation. With these warm words and a kind message, we move to the end of today's seminar. Thank you all. Thank you. And uh, any final word of thought from the Director General, Dr. Bhazar Raj Singh, B.R. Singh Ji? Hi, sir. I would like to extend my gratitude and uh, Thanks to you, it's a really very uh, knowledgeable, uh, you see the words of wisdom you have expressed before us. And uh, it, it was a really imbibing to everyone. All the participants, they will remember all the time. And I feel that uh, if uh, a uh, few things they adopt in their uh, life, their life will definitely change. Uh, yes. A lot of things I have learned at this is, uh, Thank you. Uh, Thank, you. You, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And on behalf of the School of Management Sciences, as well on behalf of the, you see the Indian Science Foundation. I thank you very much, sir. Uh, uh, on my own behalf also. Yeah, thank, thank you. Very you. kind of you. Okay, Sandeep ji, you have the last word before we go. Uh, you are not audible. 
you are muted Sandeep, can you hear yeah. can you hear us yeah yes. at the, at the end i would like to say about the br sir he is a very dynamic person and i used to read his articles in different newspaper daily and he is he is a very active like a young person <laughs> so <laughs> i really thankful uh, for uh, his presence in this seminar and i hope the panelists will get the benefit of this uh, talk and at the last i am really thankful to uh, dr vora for his time and for his uh, you know when i emailed him he he gently uh, accepted my request and i was so happy that he accepted my request for the webinar because he's a so busy person so i was never expecting to give such a, you know one and half hour time to us so i really thankful to you and at the end so i think uh, him